second meeting of 2014 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off um, as they interfere with the electronic equipment? Can I welcome to our committee today Jean Urquhart, MSP, who has an interest in this area. Welcome, Jean. Um, the first agenda item this morning is the decision to take um, agenda item four in private. Agreed. Members agreed? Future items. Oh, and future items. Yep, agreed. Okay, moving on swiftly to agenda item two, which is the main topic of our committee this morning, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the implications for Scotland. Um, our, as I say, it's our first item today. Um, can I welcome a very robust round table this morning? Um, you're very welcome, and I'll um, uh, just introduce you all very, very quickly. And No, we'll go round the table. So I'm Christina McKelvey. I'm the convener of the committee. I'm Hans Lomalik. I'm the vice convener. I'm David Anderson, current UC Scotland president. Claire Adamson, Central Scotland MSP. Mary Alexander, Unite the Union. I'm Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. I'm Scott Walker from the National Farmers Union of Scotland. Roy Coffey, MSP, Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley. <coughs> Stephen Boyd, my Assistant Secretary with the Scottish TUC. Jean Urquhart, Highlands and Islands, MSP. Ariane Andreangeli, lecturer in competition law at the University of Edinburgh. Liz Murray from the World Development Movement. Alec Rowley, MSP for Cowan Beath Constituency. Richard Dixon from Friends of the Earth Scotland. Jamie McGregor, MSP Highlands and Islands. Dave Watson from Unison Scotland. Good morning, everyone. Um, can I thank you all for um, excellent written evidence? Uh, I think we were all um, ready with our highlighters last night, highlighting some very interesting points in, in the, the, the written evidence. It was very, very helpful to inform. Uh, how we are going to ask questions this morning. I'm going to open with quite a general question. I mean, many of you have been in round tables and committees before, so you, you know the etiquette, you know, catch my eye and, and, and I'll let you in and um, uh, we'll see if we can get a bit of a flow of a conversation rather than it being, you know, across the table. But if you could just make sure that you uh, channel all your comments through me and we can keep it, you know, <laughs> civilised and under control. Um, but... Mainly for us in, in opening this inquiry, we've obviously been lobbied by many, many organisations and, and the, one of the key factors of this and the, 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 the one that's been highlighted the most is, is generally from Unison and Unite on Health. Um, but we can see right across the board there's many, many areas that are affected. Um, certainly the farmers in my constituency have been you know, lobbying me on some of the, the challenges and the, the, the concerns that they have. Um, certainly some of the people I know in the financial sector. Um, there's some really interesting uh, evidence that we had from Friends of the Earth for some things that we hadn't, you know, really touched on. Um, that, that was very, very helpful. Um, so I really, I think what I want to do is sort of open uh, our discussions this morning with maybe a wee taster from each of you in your um, area where you think, you know, the challenges are or the opportunities are. Uh, in that case, we're taking a number of evidence sessions right into the new year. So um, this, you're, you're the first one, so you're going to help to inform you know, the foundations of the inquiry. So um, I'm happy just for you to you know, put your hand up or, or catch my eye. If, um, but I'd quite like to hear from you all, really, on where, where your area is. Dave, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, happy to do that. Sir, no, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, our, our primary concern is around the area of public services. Um, we're particularly concerned that we haven't seen what we would want, which is an unequivocal uh, exclusion of public services from the, the uh, TTIP negotiations. Uh, we'd like to see the negotiations essentially operate on the basis of what's called a positive list, in other words, the things that are included, rather than trying to exclude things and leave everything else open. And we're concerned particularly because we think the, uh, the, uh, there's a lack of enforcement procedures, uh, particularly for issues like ILO standards, we think we're very concerned about the fact that um, there are allegedly going to be common regulatory standards and the US has much lower ones. And our biggest concern is over the dispute mechanism, where we're concerned that uh, there are the present very few trade barriers between the UK and the US, uh, and therefore big US corporations obviously have a, a big foot footfall in the health service in, in the United States, and we'll see this as an opportunity to come in uh, and privatise large chunks of the NHS. That's wrong because these matters should be the matters for you and, and other elected representatives to decide, not for big American corporations. Okay. Well, we just go round the table then. Does that, will that work for, for opening, Richard? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, the key concerns that we've outlined in our paper are that 
at the heart of the rationale for TTIP is more fossil fuels coming across the Atlantic to Europe. So that's a bad thing in terms of climate emissions, and it has negative, negative impacts for those who live with the extraction of those resources in the states. <coughs> the second thing is the deregulation agenda, and I've used the example of chemicals to highlight very different regimes, and if we try to bring those together, that means slackening our protection for people in the environment from toxic chemicals. And finally, agreeing with Dave, the dispute settlement system is a real worry. An example I've used is about unconventional gas and fracking. And I think this is a very clear example because we in Scotland are doing something different from the rest of the UK. The UK is very enthusiastic about unconventional gas as a government. Uh, the Scottish government is much less enthusiastic, has put in place much tougher planning rules, has had an expert panel look at the issue, and that's created two extra pieces of work, one looking at health impacts, one looking at fixing the regulatory regime, which is not fit for purpose. <coughs> We're always told that uh, there are fracking uh, nightmare stories from around the world, but it won't be like that in the UK because we'll have the best regulations in the world. And the US, of course, has some pretty lax regulations. But if we're bringing these regulations together, we won't necessarily have the best regulations. So in Scotland, we've been moving towards certainly being very cautious, perhaps even saying we're not going to have this. The rest of the UK is different. Some of Europe has bans in place. So in France, there's a ban. Uh, other countries are also cautious. And we have this example of a diff another dispute settlement uh, process being used, the NAFTA process, uh, by Lone Pine Resources, a U.S. mining company, uh, taking the Canadian government to court or to the tribunal, uh, but over what the state of Quebec has done. So I think, so sitting in Scotland, you think, right, here is a state that has done something to protect its people, and its country is now in trouble through a dispute settlement process. So uh, that very clearly shows the, the potential, if we do this wrong, for what could happen to Scotland. If we do something we think is the right thing to do, we could easily end up in the wrong place. And this is happening in Europe as well. The other example I give is about the Swedish power company Vattenfall taking uh, the German state to court. And again, about something we're interested in. This is about uh, banning nuclear or phasing out nuclear in Germany. And here a big energy company can say, well, I'm going to lose profits because of that, so I'm taking you to one of these dispute settlement processes. Again, something that's very important to Scotland because we're on that same track of phasing out nuclear. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, so I'm, I'm going to echo probably <laughs> some of what Dave and Richard have said and what I'm sure the others are going to say. But um, So our, um, our, the heart of our concerns are the fact that this treaty is um, very much taking a neoliberal, um, is, is a neoliberal uh, move towards liberalisation, particularly of public services. Um, it's um, what, uh, we're obviously we're concerned about the ISDS within that, that that hands power um, or tips the balance of power away from governments uh, towards corporations um, through the ability for them to sue, and that in turn shrinks the policy space for governments to um, to devise policies and regulate in the public interest so that um, and that covers a whole range of things from food safety you know the public services the environment human rights um, and and the other issue for us is the regulatory harmony that Richard uh, harmonization that Richard um, spoke about a moment ago which we believe is a threat to progressive legislation um, and um, and it's bit and the and TTIP um, particularly the regulatory harmony aspect of TTIP is something that's going further than other trade agreements have and is, has been touted as setting a, a gold standard for other trade agreements and so our concern is also then for countries, particularly developing countries, um, operating under similar trade agreements in the future. Um, we've questioned the basis of, the, of some of the sort of political sport, especially in Westminster, for, um, for TTIP on the basis of economic growth and jobs. Um, and that's certainly, um, there's, ver there's varying research showing, um, based on different kinds of modelling techniques, um, that show different outcomes, very different outcomes for economic growth and jobs. And I've put some of that in my um, evidence. And then from the point of view of Scotland, obviously there's a, there's a, a range of, um, of possible areas um, to be considered and, and to be concerned about, and that is the public services here, um, including... 
uh, Scottish Water as well as the NHS, perhaps. Um, the, um, difficulties over renationalising the railways, for example, with the example of um, the East Coast Rail this morning, um, and the post office, um, and local authorities as well. Um, that the um, that that is likely to. Um, uh, so we saw a leaked text in July that indicates that schools' food buying practices might be exempted from TTIP, but that public hospitals of more than 500 beds and public universities will still be currently included. So um, that threatens policies to boost local economies, for example. And we have, you know, in Scotland, um, there are pro pro procurement policy that can support local economies, and that could force those to open up. So there's a clear disadvantage for public policy, but actually also for SMEs in Scotland in that um, that different competition space. Um, so, and there's the issue of transparency, although that is being beginning to be addressed now. There was some news on that yesterday, but that's still we still would like to see that going further because I think there's a, there's a distinct lack of information, particularly for policymakers. Yeah, thank you very much, Ariana. Um, I suppose that I take a different, I, as you will have seen from my recent evidence, I take a slightly different tack. Um, I, I would like to preface my evidence by saying that I'm a competition lawyer and my interest lies in issues of market access uh, and now I'm, I'm conducting some new research on markets and healthcare provision, especially in the space of public health. And I would like to start by saying that the European Union, either as an internal actor or as an international actor, works within a very well defined Fine framework of what we call conferred competencies. In other words, the EU cannot act unless it is, in, it is acting in areas that are conferred upon it by the member states. The member states remain the masters of the treaty. So unless the, the treaty states expressly that the EU has a, a competency in acting in certain policy areas, then the EU cannot take any such action. If, on the one hand, trade is uh, enumerated as one of these exclusive competencies, we have to bear in mind that the exercise of competencies, even, they are, even though they are exclusive, has to work within the complex framework of the treaty and the principle of conferral. And in, if, my interest in public health uh, as, um, as, 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 per, as per me on in, in researching this particular issue of competencies. And in respect to the provision of healthcare systems, Article 168 of the treaty provides for competencies uh, to the EU which are neither exclusive uh, as trade, nor even shared. The EU has, ve has got very limited competencies when it comes to the provision of healthcare services. These are competencies of a supporting nature. So this means that the EU can only act to the extent that it um, coordinates or supports the action of the member states. It is clearly stated in the treaty, and we have to remember that the treaty is the constitution of the European Union, no more, no less, and can only be amended through treaty amendment procedures with the consensus of all member states, that member states remain free to decide how to design frameworks for the provision of public health services. This cannot be changed unless there is a treaty amendment, less so through an international national agreement. And in fact, what you will have seen from my written evidence in respect to, for instance, these concerns for the NHS that has, have been raised, and are quite legitimate, and I think that the public should engage in these discussions more widely, because these are live issues today, is that it is not true TTIP that that power of the member states to decide whether to provide healthcare services through the market or outside market is threatened, simply because the EU has no power uh, unless the, the member states accept to confer to the EU powers to do that, to modify the choices of the member states, less so to mandate the member states um, in uh, what type of form, what type of framework the member states want to construe for the provision of healthcare services. Now, it, people will be familiar with the Patients Directive and other pieces of legislation that the EU has enacted in the field of healthcare. However, again, these have to be seen as part and parcel of the supporting and coordinating competence. For instance, the Patients Directive is there to facilitate the provision of healthcare services for individuals that work in different member states from member states in which they are resident. And, you know, I'm probably shining an example of that because I am Italian and uh, I sometimes find myself working in other member states. And pieces of legisl such, uh, legislation such as the Patients Directive enshrine a number of rights that are not new because they're part of the Aki, they're part of the case law of the Court of Justice, that I can exercise vis-a-vis -vis healthcare providers in, a not, in, not, in other member states for the purpose, for instance, of continuing the provision of care. 
Now, uh, this is not going to change with TTIP because a change in that nature of competence is only possible through treaty amendment. And there is extensive case law that allows member states to justify derogations from principles concerning, for instance, the single market and competition based on the public interest in the field of health. Going to public procurement, um, public procurement is another area in which there is extensive EU legislation. However, in as much as public procurement legislation adopted at the EU level is applicable, what is clear is that whenever services are what we call essential services to the person, including healthcare, what is applicable to, these, to the award of these contracts is what we call a light touch regime. So there is just a principle of transparency and the principle of non-discrimination, or whether member states can, and the Court of Justice has reiterated that they absolutely can, uh, state principles that are inspired by non-market concepts with a view to, for instance, localised services. Because, for instance, in the field of healthcare protection, uh, there have been cases saying that you can uh, identify an area from which providers have to come from because that is germane to continuity of care. So again, what I would like to stress, I suppose, at the very outset is that the EU might have exclusive competence in trade, however, that exclusive competence must be exercised within a framework of constitutional principles that are inspired by principle of conferred powers. Healthcare being not an area of exclusive competence, not even shared, but supporting, that means that actions of the EU cannot have consequences that are so wide-ranging as perhaps we have, you know, it's been depicted so far. And again, public procurement, public procurement is certainly very important and is there so that everybody can have a go at public contracts. However, and I, if, uh, if, if the chair of the committee wants me to entertain you on, on this respect, there are uh, a number of ways in which for instance, healthcare can be provided, so while public procurement does not even come into the picture. Okay, <laughs> if very comprehensive. Jamie, did you want to end with a quick supplementary well, first? question on that point. Um, I believe TTIP it w w would be a mixed agreement, wouldn't it? A, a mixed agreement, so it would be shared compet competency. Yes. In other words, it would have to be ratified by all 28 member states. Correct. What happens if a member state, one member state vetoes? W one member state vetoes it, then in that, in that case the treaty will not have effect. Will not, um, it, would, it wouldn't go ahead. Exactly, because the ratification has to be across the whole membership, yes. Yes, all yes. right. Um, I, I suppose that that is, you know, that again is very much for member states to, to decide upon because each and every member state has got its own ratification process. So, yeah. Is it possible that other member states would, would sort of bully member states who wouldn't sign up to it? I am a lawyer, I'm not a politician, and uh, I suppose that um, I suppose that, that could be... We have to, to draw a very clear distinction between the legality of the conclusion of such agreements and their entry into force, and the judgment that it is as to their opportunity, and that is a political judgment. Of course, member states that are so inclined and are interested and believe in TTIP because, you know, they, they see it and that is, you know, completely acceptable if, as a political judgment that TTIP would be beneficial for them. They could exert diplomatic pressure on another member state. However, ultimately, it is a judgment as to opportunity, so, you know, way beyond my pay grade, I'm afraid. Yeah. Can I, just one last thing. Um, the, I understand that there's been seven rounds of negotiations so far. Mm -hmm. How, what level would you say we're at? I mean, if the negotiations were, uh, what, what stage are we at? Are we halfway through? Are we quarter way through? Are we, you know? Uh, it's very difficult to tell because negotiations have been taking place, as far as I understood them on the timeline, in parallel across a number of different policy areas. Uh, so it depends very much where you're sitting. It, it, it depends very much whether you're looking, say, at uh, negotiations in the area of um, regulatory standards or, or because some areas are more advanced than others in terms of the amount, the extent of the discussions and the extent to which you can say that there is some shared understanding. For instance, uh, taking, for instance, the issue of intellectual property, intellectual property now seems to be off the table, and uh, you know, for very good reasons, I think, uh, even from the legality, from a legality standpoint. Um, another area in which the, uh, negotiations are suspended because the Commission wishes to take more evidence is the area of the investor state dispute settlement. Uh, so, I, I, my, my educated guess is that probably we are about a quarter ahead. 
uh, because there, is still, there are still a number of areas in which discussions are not as advanced as in others. Thanks. Claire, did you want to come in quickly? Good morning. Um, Good morning to you. You mentioned the case law in, in member states being able to defend positions with it. Can I ask if that case law is within the context of the single market in the EU, or is there case law in terms of um, member states defending against existing bilateral agreements out no, of the EU? No, that case law is concerns the um, extent. I assume you're referring to health case law in the field of healthcare. Is that is yes, that what yes. you mentioned? It's case law. It's case law. Thank you very much. Allow me to make that clarification. That is case law of the Court of Justice of the, repeat, the European Union in respect to the implementation of rules on the single market and the extent to which justifications can be uh, constructed with a view to uh, justifying, for instance, restrictions on the principles of, of uh, free movement on grounds of public interest, especially the protection of health. And in that case, the European Court of Justice has made it very clear that member states retain their power to decide how to design the, the, the health services when that, because the EU takes the provision of the highest possible level of health care as one of its keystone principles, its keystone objectives. And so it is a, a germane objective, if you like, and member states remain um, free to decide how to provide that health care, and they can carve out exceptions from principles of free market, for instance, free, free movement, for instance, free movement of services especially, because that can be essential for continuity of care, care provision, and eventually the survival of their own population. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, I think I'm going to let our other witnesses finish and then I'll let our members back in. Sorry, Rod. Uh, Stephen. Okay, uh, thanks. I'm um, joined this morning, obviously, by a number of colleagues from our affiliated trade unions, so I'll leave the specific sector impacts to them and confine myself to a few brief comments about the economic rationale for TTIP and the potential impact uh, of it. Um, I think, as our submission makes clear, we are very, very sceptical about the economic economic benefits of TTIP. I think for two main reasons, as a couple of people have already pointed out, traditional barriers to trade between the EU and the US are already very low, and therefore you know, the gains that are likely to be uh, made from TTIP are likely to be minimal at best. I think a number of the studies that have been used to promote the economic benefits of TTIP as well are hardly convincing. The models that they use are, as always with economic models, very sensitive to what they leave in and what they leave out. And you know, particularly in terms of looking at ways in which TTIP might actually impede growth and jobs, things like the frivolous patents that are common and common in the US and likely to become much more common in the EU as a result of TTIP and also the cost and availability of prescription drugs, which I think is uh, significantly higher in the US than it currently is in the EU. Now, unless your model is going to include these negative impacts, then the model isn't really telling us very much. I think probably more importantly, we're very concerned that TTIP will lead to a general lowering of standards across the economy as a whole and will be actively detrimental to the economic social model that I think the Scottish Government is trying to create in Scotland, but certainly the trade unions are trying to work with other partners to create as well. We need to be clear that it's not about removing what we would traditionally describe as barriers to trade. It's about imposing a common regulatory structure that will be policed by an international mechanism that would not be passed by the normal democratic processes in each country. And I think that's really crucial to, to understand. Uh, I think it's also, in looking at the, the gains to trade, we tend to be, I mean, I think the economic orthodoxy is much too relaxed about assuming uh, you know, the benefits from uh, any gains to trade, and they don't look at the distributional impact, and I would argue that the evidence shows that the lower the traditional barriers to trade, such as tariffs and quotas, are, any move to extend free trade further, the distributional impact tends to be much greater. So even some of the models that have been used to promote the economic benefits have actually been quite clear in saying that there will be job losses as a result of this. The people who are displaced are very unlikely, again, evidence shows, to gain jobs in the future that pay at similar rates or employ them at a similar level of skill. So although you might be able to argue that the economy as a whole will benefit in, in the future, there will be big distributional impacts. And if we're always concerned about inequality, as we all proclaim to be at this moment in time, then we need to understand that trade agreements have a, a major, major impact on that moving forward. OK, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Scott. Thank you, Kameran. Um, in relation to TTIP, um, 
I'm going to talk about food and agriculture, which for the private sector, the non-government sector, is probably unique in, in the sense that we've all got to consume it. So the impact of TPTIP will impact on everyone who consumes agricultural products. And within Scotland, agriculture stretches across the whole of Scotland into all the rural communities, into you know, the central belt of Scotland, manufacturing, everywhere. So the extent of TTIP impact will be quite significant for agriculture. Now, potentially, there are some gains, and talk about them later on, on today. But I want to just talk about potential negatives as, as we see it so far, and really concentrating into, into two areas just now. Uh, the first area is about the different approach to food standards that the US takes compared to the European Union. And on this, I would, I would flag up two, two specific issues just now. One is about the competition issue that uh, domestic producers face. Particularly in Scotland, if we look at uh, impacts here in Scotland, that will be felt strongest in our beef sector, which is really one of the uh, big achievements of the food and export market from, from Scotland. And we face strong different competition in the beef sector here because of the standards crossing in the US, USA. The other thing uh, to do with standards is about recognition by consumers. So under the TTIP rules, as I understand them, we won't be able to actually label these differences to, to consumers. So consumers won't be able to make a, a fair choice as to the products, products they, they make. Studies up until now have tended to show that while you know, consumers perhaps say the right things when asked about which products they wish to, to, to consume, all too often, when it comes to actually purchase decisions within, within the supermarkets, they make those purchase decisions on prices alone. So if the st trading standards are different between the United States and the European Union, we could see quite a negative impact in a lot of agriculture production here, which in a time of volatility and uh, concerns about food security, we've got to be concerned, concerned in that area. Uh, the second aspect is, it's been touched on uh, so far already this morning, but in relation to agriculture, about protecting intellectual property. And we've got a unique system here within Europe about geographical indicators. So for Scotland, that's in relation to the likes of Scotch whisky, Scotch beef, Scotch lamb. Also goes down to individual products, and to name but two is the likes of Arbro Smokies and Dundee Cake which the, the United States of America don't recognise our use of geographical indicators. So potentially, again, it comes back to competition that is faced in the agricultural se sector. On that, I would stop, stop just now, but um, our overall view is of general concern about the impact on jobs and security within rural communities. Okay. Mary. Thanks. Um, my, our concerns um, have been mentioned by, by most people, and Dave highlighted at the, the beginning of um, uh, the discussion the concerns around the NHS and uh, public bodies. We welcome the, first, the former First Minister, Alex Salmond's letter to David Cameron, which is asking him to use his veto to exclude the NHS from TTIP. And I quote in it, it says, Scotland must not be bound into a trade deal that threatens the public ownership of the NHS and could undermine the democratic decisions of the Scottish people. Now, we're part of a broad coalition um, campaign. If you go on to hashtag no TTIP, um, there's uh, quite a lot of information there. And um, there's no doubt that there's huge opposition to TTIP and what it means. Um, I won't go over the arguments about the inclusion of I ISDS, but I think we've all seen examples in the evidence of corporations suing governments such as Philip Morris suing the Australian government over the, um, the plain packaging legislation in 2012, um, the German government being sued by the Swedish energy uh, giant Vattenfall for losses in consideration of Germany's phasing out of the um, nuclear programme, Occidental and the 1.77 billion, um, they've uh, sued Ecuador, uh, well, the, the, they've won damages from Ecuador for. 
despite the fact that um, Occidental actually broke Ecuadorian law, um, and that was the reason for the contract being terminated in the first place. So we, we have um, huge concerns about um, the democracy, transparency, accountability, and, of course, labour rights. Um, the Treaty on Labour Rights is a major cause for concern for trade unions. It's well-founded because often any labour rights chapter is incorporated as a non-binding appendix to free trade treaties rather than being part of the substantive text. And we've already heard from um, Republican Congress men um, that they are only willing to agree TTIP if extending EU labour standards to the US is rolled out, ruled out in advance. So, for instance, US Trade Representative Ron Kirk has said that the agreement would seek substantial progress on addressing liberalisation in areas of service, investment, labour and the environment. And Dave mentioned earlier uh, the right to work states um, and what that means for um, American workers. And we've got very real concerns about um, that being extended to the EU and um, been participating in, in the race to the bottom. The ETUC General Secretary Bernadette Segal has also underlined that um, trade unionists oppose the inclusion of the investor state dispute settlement provisions in the agreement, considering that both parties are advanced economies with well developed legal systems. The ETUC sees no reason to create a bypass to national courts for foreign investors. And again, that is a, a really big concern that we have, that there are corporate lawyers behind closed doors with uh, no openness around um, the decisions that they're making around, about national states and corporations. And we believe that TTIP should include a comprehensive and enforceable labour development chapter. The European Union and US have got their own um, legal systems and the, we would want them to commit to the ratification and full implementation of the core labour standards of the UN International Labour Organisation and that's a, a, a key thing for us. Thanks. Thanks very much. David. Thank you. Um, I suppose being last, there's, there's very little left to say. Um, I would like to agree with a, a number of points that my, my trade union colleagues have made this morning but highlight something that, that Dave mentioned on the importance of a positive list for areas that are included within TTIP rather than calling for exclusions of particular areas. Um, that's particularly important when government can change the, the classification of, of one particular public service. Um, the example that's given is, is further education in England, which previously had been regarded as part of the public sector and recently has been reclassified as a um, non-profit institution servicing households, which um, moves it out of the public sphere into a, um, a, a semi-private and open to, to competition area. <clears throat> Excuse me. The importance of uh, highlighting the role of education. Um, universities in Scotland play a, a significant role in the economy and society and culture within the country. I think it's important to recognise that while universities themselves are autonomous and independent institutions, they, they form a, a kind of mixed economy of public, private and, and third sector support to deliver that um, research and teaching. And it's very difficult to classify that within one particular sector. It plays a, a unique role. And I think it's something that having a positive list of areas that are included would then provide protection for the areas that, that we, we don't want included. Um, and it helps focus the debate on what may be the benefits. And I would agree that the, the, the evidence for the benefits coming from TTIP is limited. And whatever those benefits may be, keeping that in a narrow area protects the, the rest of, of the areas that we're concerned about. OK, thank you. Rod, you were wanting in halfway yeah, round. I uh, uh, would like to focus a little bit, if I can, on investor state dispute settlements. Um, so perhaps I could pose a question as devil's advocate rather than ordinary advocate, which I am. Um, the UK is currently a party to uh, 90 bilateral uh, agreements, all of which have... Uh, ISDS clauses in them. Um, to date, there have only been 
two actions against the UK, neither of which involve kind of matters of kind of public policy. Um, why is that? And why would you distinguish what's now proposed from that? And also a bit of clarification would be helpful as to why the European Commission have suspended hearings on ISDS at the moment. So I think we are talking about something which is very different in terms of scale and different in terms of who we're negotiating with. So this will be the biggest free trade agreement in the world, if it comes about, and it will be with the most litig litigious country in the world. So that suggests the, the ante has going up seriously. Uh, we have had, of course, reassurances. You have some of them in the SPICE briefing. So you've had, we've had reassurances from UK ministers and from commission officials and commissioners telling us that, of course, they will protect all these things and that we don't need to worry too much. But you would assume that Germany probably had that same sort of reassurance when they signed up to the energy treaty that they're now being asked to pay out nearly $5 billion for phasing out nuclear. You would assume that the state of Quebec thought that they probably wouldn't be in court or in a tribunal because they were doing something right about putting a moratorium on fracking. So uh, I think we, the, the scale of what we're signing up for and the country that we're signing up with suggests that there is a much greater danger that we will end up in a lot of complex uh, disputes which will go to tribunals. And I think the other side of that is that if that starts to come true, what that starts to mean is that for every elected representative, you start to think, well, shall we put a law in place about that? Shall we pass this piece of policy? Because we might end up in court because of it. So it starts to slow down your powers as the Scottish Parliament because you, you're always at the back of your mind thinking, oh, hang on, well, how will the US react to that? Will Europe track down on us because it's going to get us in trouble with the US? So there's this regulatory chill effect that potentially comes. So I, so I think the answer to your question is, yes, some of these exist, and the UK perhaps has been lucky, but other countries have certainly suffered because they've been part of these dispute systems. But the one that we're potentially signing up to is of such a bigger scale and such a more potentially dangerous partner, that we will certainly suffer if, uh, if it's not written right or simply got rid of. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Ariana, do you want to come in on the question no, about... I think that was clear. No, you, you wanted to comment. Um, I was just going to just add a tiny bit of detail only to what Richard was saying, and that was to do with um, the, the scale, and particularly the foreign direct investment that from the US to the UK, which um, is is substantial here and that's another key factor in the difference between perhaps some of the other bilateral trade agreements that the UK signed up to and, and this one. Um, it's a quarter of a trillion dollars that the US, of FDI the US has to the UK and it's also helpful to look at NAFTA which has been around for 20 years now and perhaps to consider um, Canada as a similar possible example to the UK and the number of um, cases that have been brought against the Canadian government by US investors and that's 30 um, in the last 20 years um, many of which haven't been settled some of which have been thrown out on merit um, but some some of them have resulted in compensation being paid or certainly legal costs being paid by the Canadian government and um, one or two of them have resulted in changes of policy it, um, as a result of that kind of chilling effect that Richard described. Dave. Yeah. Uh, focusing particularly on, on the health thing, and obviously also bear in mind the points that Adriani would please. Obviously, it's dangerous having two lawyers giving evidence at the same time, and you'd be pleased to hear I'm not going to have a legal debate with Adriana on the finer points of European law, because I largely agree with her. Um, I think what I would, however, add to the Roger's point is, is, is more the practicalities of it, is that it may well be a theoretical league position as Adriana has set it out, but the practical examples, that, you know, Slovakia on, in, their, in their health insurance system that we highlighted, particularly the Australian, I'm sure the Australians weren't expecting a challenge from William Morris on the tobacco controls. Um, Richard's right about the regulatory chill point. Um, I, I've got a fair amount of experience over many years of dealing with Scottish Government law officers and local authority uh, legal officers uh, trying to do things. And the, the usual reaction from a law officer in any public sector is, is you might get challenged, Minister. And this is the real threat here, that it's not actually necessary there is going to be a challenge or we will get to the European Court of Justice. It's just that that 
freezing, if you like, of not doing anything that might be a wee bit risky on that basis. And the big change here is that US corporations are notoriously litigious. They have huge legal departments that make the Scottish government law officers look you know, like a wee high street solicitors in comparison. And that's the real challenge here on that basis. The other health issue in relation to this to recognise is that Scotland, of course, is not the member state here. Uh, appreciate that, that that might be an issue of debate, but clearly on the, uh, it's, that's not the case at, at present. So if Scotland isn't the member state, it's the UK, and therefore where's the legal challenge going to come here? Is the UK government really going on the health, for example, to mount the sort of legal challenge we might want to mount in Scotland when we have very different health systems that there's a fairly broad consensus across the political parties in Scotland on that point. So I think I, I don't dispute the, the, the strict legal view, but I would say the practical examples I've illustrated will illustrate that we do have a real problem potentially with TTIP and the way to sort that is just to exclude and use the positive list approach and therefore there's no there's, there won't be that risk in the first place. In relation to your question, um, the reason why talks on, on the uh, investor state dispute settlement mechanism have been suspended is because uh, Carol de Gucht, who was the trade commissioner and then now the current, the new one, the one as a member uh, of the Juncker Commission, both wished to have greater um, scope for debate. So the reason why the talks were frozen was because the EU decided, and quite rightly to my mind, unilaterally to gather extra evidence. So there was an online consultation that is either already expired, just expired or is about to expire in the next couple of weeks. And that's why talks have been suspended, because there was, uh, there was clearly a need felt uh, for greater debate in terms of in investor state dispute settlement. Um, in relation to uh, the, comment that just, the comments that have just been made, uh, I would like to say it is true, Scotland is a regional government within a unitary state and uh, the EU takes a view that a unitary, the, the EU takes a view that the member state is the member state and then the member states itself as a matter of domestic uh, institutional setups decide how to best distribute powers uh, whether vertically or, or horizontally across uh, administrations but obviously the liability, if you like, the rights and the liabilities uh, for instance, in the context of the treaty, fall with that member state seen almost as a Westphalian sort of entity. Uh, so I can see, I can see where the, whether Dave's comments on Scotland and Scotland choices come from. However, we have to bear in mind that Scotland um, enjoys powers to fully regulate the health services in Scotland uh, according to the Scotland Act. So I, I, to, be, to be completely honest, I see that actually as a safeguard for Scotland because before that can be changed, there needs to be had a debate in Westminster about the Scotland Act. And the way things are, are evolving in this respect, there seems to be quite a lot of appetite for devolving more powers to Holyrood, to this parliament, as opposed to taking them away. So to be completely honest, unless, uh, unless politicians were completely schizophrenic, schizophrenic in this respect, which I frankly don't believe, I don't see that, that backtracking on the NHS happening. Uh, and finally, in respect to the ISDS, I, as a lawyer, I see it as a source of some concern because I actually believe in the benefits of having an effective court system as all the democracies in the world have. And it is really important that disputes are heard in what we call in the continent the juge naturel, i.e. the natural judge for that particular claimant. And so I, I think that the, the great danger of ISDS is that uh, it takes away from the court disputes that are very important Important. And to be completely honest, I don't see why judges should not be well versed in dealing with those disputes. However, at the same time, in terms of the liability of states for consequences in terms of changes in policy, there is a well-established principle in international law that changes in policies dictated by public interest uh, and um, made in, bo in, in good faith uh, and carried through uh, according to well-established true rules are not cha challengeable in respect of tort liability. So in many ways, there are checks and balances in the applicable rules in that respect that will have a bearing on the limits of liability of states. Willie Coffey. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Uh, just, uh, we'll, we'll hear, no doubt, in due course, what the United Kingdom government's view on this is if their representative comes to, to this committee. And particularly, I'm interested in the comments that Mrs. Angelini made 
about the conferred competencies now. If, if all the member states agree to this, then all of these things, all these worries and fears can therefore happen. Is there a view amongst uh, colleagues around the table about what the current views of the member states are with respect to providing access to healthcare services within their jurisdictions? Are they all against it or are they all in favour of it or do we just not know? Liz? I think um, the concern here, frankly, is I, I, mean, I well understand the argument, and it's absolutely right that if it was to go out with the current competencies, yes, it would need a, a change uh, and approval by each of the member states, and that, that varies, of course. In the UK, it probably would only require a piece of secondary legislation to do that. In other countries, it would need a piece of primary legislation or at least approval of their, of their, of their parliament. So I think there are different mechanisms. My concern is actually that this might not get to that stage because the EU negotiators will say, well, actually, uh, this doesn't impact on, uh, we're not exceeding the competencies there, and therefore it will end up in the legal mechanism, so it will be judges, not parliaments, making these, these decisions. And I think uh, that these decisions are largely political ones about the way that we run our health service, for example, and other issues as well. Uh, and I think that's where it ought to, be, ought to remain, rather than take a, frank a punt on uh, judges or an arbitration panel uh, under a, a mechanism like ISDS. Who have I got next? Sorry, Jamie. Oh. Willie, do you want oh. to come back on that aye, first? Aye, right, Jamie, you, I'll come to you next. Sorry. Um, I wonder if Mrs Andrea and Jelly could maybe clarify this then. Uh, if the member states don't agree that access can be made to their respective health services, how can it how can that be overcome and how can the will of the member states be overcome even through the court? Simply here, the principle of conferred competence says that the EU can only act in those areas that are identified as areas that are conferred to it by the treaties. And clearly, for instance, healthcare services, that is pr pr provision of public healthcare services, that is, a, is an area where the EU enjoys a very limited competence. And I don't see that happening. Even if the EU successfully came to a head and negotiated and agreed to a common text, then that common text would be effective to, in respect of those areas of competence that fall within the competence of the EU at that particular time. So if healthcare provision does not fall in those areas in which the EU can, uh, if you like, commit the member states in according to the principle of conferred competences, bar for a treaty amendment, that change cannot happen. Member states remain free in their respective jurisdiction to say, well, it's it, okay, we accept that healthcare is a service and therefore enjoys the principles of free movement of services, for instance, or whether we remain sovereign, if you like, on the way in which we are going to provide these services to our own population. So if we want to go through a mechanism in which we have ownership of the health service by the state directly or by controlled bodies, then so be it. The EU cannot mandate us, nor the EU is saying that it will mandate the member states into privatising health services. I, I completely don't buy, on the basis of the principle of conferred competence, this much banded argument that TTIP, or for all that matter, the application of the free movement of services rules will lead to privatisation by stealth. That simply cannot happen through the EU. Then obviously it falls within the member states. If the member states think that that is actually a very good idea, then that's a choice of domestic politics. The EU has no responsibility in it simply because the EU enjoys no power into that particular area. I don't know if that satisfies your, uh, your concern, your question. So uh, it does actually, it's really helping this convener, so, so individual member states could make individual independent decisions and, and allow access to their health services? Or not, or right. not. Right. They can go for marketisation or, right. or they can commit themselves okay. to public provision. Just to give you, and right. these also, I would like to add, in relation to the rules on public procurements that were mentioned earlier on, these are also a bearing on the scope of public procurement because, for instance, the case law in this respect is very clear. The public procurement rules, uh, beyond, going beyond the, the two key principles of transparency and non-discrimination, will not apply if services are provided uh, in the way that we call in-house, i.e. either through, uh, either internalise them through uh, member state structure, for instance, through healthcare authorities, for instance, or through bodies that the healthcare authorities have significant control over. Uh, 
So if we imagine, for instance, a system like the healthcare services in Scotland with healthcare authorities that control hospitals, then those, if the controlled hospital were to provide medical health services to the population, those would not have to go out to tender because that hospital is under the strategic and functional control of the state authority that commits the service and commits the resources, of course. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jimmy. Oh, thank you. Um, well, my first one is about ISDS, but the second Can one I is... A, a, okay. Um, the points made by Mary Alexander and David Anderson are concerns that are very well made, and I think it's very important that they're uh, you, you know, brought up at this stage. Um, I know one of the most contentious points is ISDS, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, uh, I'm, but I'm aware that there is at the moment um, the largest ever commission consultation on, on ISDS, which has just closed, and had 150,000 replies, and I imagine a good few of those are lawyers. Um, so so I, I said it would be interesting to see what comes out of that. Um, ISDS, as far as I, I'm aware... ISDS can only be evoked if capital is expropriated. And that's something that would already be against UK law, I believe. So my question, I suppose, is, is ISDS any different uh, from UK contract law or any other laws for that matter? Who's best? Dave, are you best um, to... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just start, the starting point, I mean, I think the difficulty is it's the definition of expropriation. Uh, if you look at the cases that we've referred to, um, you know, that's, that's been given in some cases certainly a fairly, a, fairly, a fairly broad view. It's certainly the case, I agree with you, Jeremy, you can't just uh, say, oh, well, the American Corporation can't come along and say, oh, we want to bid for a hospital in Glasgow. There would have to, to be a link with the, with the contract. So, for example, there would already have to be some element of, of uh, they would have to have a contract, essentially, with some element of, of the service. They would have to show, be able to show some loss. So it's not a case of just an opportunity loss. There would actually have to be a real uh, cost to, to them or real expropriation in that case. So I agree that limits the, the potential for challenge. The, the worry is that um, in, in the UK, particularly in health services, of course, uh, the, particularly in England, we, you know, people tend to think, even in Scotland, we have this sort of monolith of public service, but actually you know, a third of the Scottish Government budget goes in uh, uh, purchasing goods and services out with the public sector. So there's already a fair amount of private sector work, even in Scotland, but in the health service, of course, we have a very clear difference between the political approach in, in England to that of Scotland, uh, and that's my, my concern, essentially, is that Scotland will not have the ability to be able to influence that if the sort of legal challenges come against a, a member state. And the way to deal with this is, I agree again with Adrian, that it, you know, the, the treaty may not even mention the NHS, it doesn't have to. Um, but because you know it could be implied in a, in a legal challenge, that's why we want the positive list. If you have the positive list, then there's no doubt. You either do one of two things: you exclude the NHS explicitly in the treaty, which is one way of doing it. Another one is to say the only things that are covered by the treaty is in the positive list. Again, that protects the NHS. So you know we can argue about the legal potential legal challenges, but my my point is there's a very easy way to sort this. If the UK government is not trying to encourage the privatisation of the NHS, uh, NHS in Scotland through the back door using TTIP, then it should be have no difficulty in agreeing the positive list approach. And therefore, we'll all say thank you very much and we'll, we won't have any problem uh, in relation to, to that, particular, that particular issue. So I think that's the, that's the challenge here. There's an easy solution. If politicians don't want to take the easy solution, you have to question their motives for not doing so. Clear. Sorry, um, Dave, you, you said the, the way to solve it is to exclude public services. I'm concerned about the definition of public services, given the context of education. We have in local government, we have alios and trusts that have been set up. We have our, the um, PFI contracts for schools um, and hospitals that involve catering staff and uh, those kind of complexities and outsourcing of NHS laboratory services, etc. So, how how 
how Kate Tate can we define what public services means? The EU, as I know, the EU has been debating um, the question of services of non-economic interest for, for some considerable time. It has never actually got to a definition in, in Europe uh, that everyone's agreed on, so um, I'm not confident that we're going to crack that one either, and certainly I'm not confident that Europe's going to crack uh, that one either. So I think there is a difficulty. There are all sorts of grey areas. Uh, I would have to say, in fairness, that, that the, the prospects, and PFI obviously is a subject close to my heart. I've written a book on the subject. Um, and um, uh, I would, however, say that there are limited grounds, I think, to worry in terms of the PFI contracts, um, uh, be they the current ones or the old-style ones. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that if, you, if we wanted, to, for example, to buy out PFI, if we had... We, See, there's an announcement we made somewhere else as we're speaking. If, uh, which I, if we got the sort of borrowing powers that I would like, then obviously one of the things I'd like to see is, is buying out PFI contracts. Uh, and therefore, you know, you could immediately say, well, hang on, there are American corporations um, who have a, a stay in a number of PFI contracts across the, U the UK. And, but the point about that is that, uh, Jeremy's actually right, that because there is existing contract law, um, that actually the only way of buying those out is by agreement. In other words, you'd have to agree with the current provider to buy that out. So if you've reached an agreement, you can't then do a legal challenge under TTIP because essentially you've agreed to the change of the contract. So I think those sorts of challenges are, are less likely in these circumstances. Alec. When we, when we took evidence from the Italian ambassador and we put to him about the health service, his view was very much that public services um, are not included within TTIP, and that was, that was the view that he took. I just, I just wonder about that. But I suppose when we talked last week to the MEPs, David Martin, for example, talked about um, a good TTIP being really good for, for, for jobs, for skills, and I noticed, Stephen, the, what the STUC says on that, and, and perhaps maybe you could, you could expand a bit in terms of you see here about a commission that could, could, could have a look at this. Perhaps you can maybe expand a, a, a bit on that. And I do wonder, um, in terms of what, what particularly each organisation's position is, because Unite, the union, as I understand it, have said that we should oppose um, TTIP and, and the position should be that, that the UK should, should, should be taking a, petition, a position which is that we're against TTIP. And I just wonder what each organisation thinks. Is there, is there, as David Martin, MEP, described it, a good TTIP to be had from this? Um, or, or actually, is, 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 is it the case that we should be saying that this is not in the interest of uh, Scotland and it's not in the interest of the workers across the UK? Stephen. Hey. No, absolutely, absolutely accept David's point that if you lose from the current negotiations the things that we don't like and we'll flag in our submissions, there could be a good TTIP to be had, I think is a reasonable intellectual position. My problem is I just don't feel as if I have the information that would let me say, you know, uh, without any doubt at this moment in time that that is the case, particularly for Scotland. You know, I mean, what is David's case? Where does he see the sectors being that are going to benefit from TTIP? What does that mean for Scotland? What will be the net, net jobs impact? Where will the losses be? I don't see this information being available in Scotland at all. I'm not aware of the Scottish Government having done any analytical work. I'm not aware of Scottish Enterprise having done any analytical work. If the Scottish Government and the enterprise agencies think there is a case to be made here, then please, by all means, present that case to us and we'll look at it with an unjoined eye. In sheer economic development terms, I can accept that you know, hidden in there somewhere there may well be a good case, but it's not been presented to us. Nobody is making that case in Scotland at this moment in time. Okay, this, this committee is uh, writing further to the MEP specifically on TTIP to get an up-to-date position because we covered lots of topics last week with a session with MEPs, so uh, we're writing to them specifically on that point. Liz, you've got some interesting evidence in your written evidence that was that's maybe on the same tack. On, on jobs yeah. in particular. Um, yeah, so um, there's been some criticism. The, the UK government has particularly... Or there's an impact assessment that was done by the European Commission, um, and that's, uh, the modelling from that has been criticised. Um, 
because it is here, and, and, the, and the, the figures ha have been used by the UK government on growth and jobs taken from that impact assessment. Um, but it has some very, um, it has some assumptions um, in it that we don't believe relate very well to the real world. Um, assumptions, for example, that markets are perfectly competitive, efficient, and in equilibrium. In other words, there's a buyer for every product or service that's available, um, including labour. Um, and they've been criticised for being open to bias, that the information that's gone in, is, uh, as in all models, <laughs> um, has influ influenced the information that's come out. Um, and they rely on, uh, on very optimistic assumptions to do with reducing tariffs and non-tariff barriers. So it re relies on eliminating 100% of tariffs, um, half of, of all the non-tariff barriers, or at least those that could be have action taken on them to be removed across all sectors of the economy um, and 50% of government procurement restrictions um, being lifted. Um, so I don't know how that relates to what Ariana's said actually but um, it also looks at job, job displacement so where people are forced out of uncompetitive industries it assumes they'll find a job immediately. So there are some um, big questions around that. Um, and there's other research then that's come out since. So there's a peer-reviewed study that came out from Tufts University, um, which I, can, I, I referenced actually in my evidence, but I can, I can send around a, um, a specific link to that. But um, a couple of the things that came out of that is that TTIP would lead to net losses in terms of net exports after a decade compared to the baseline of no TTIP. So that um, it would lead to net losses in terms of GDP, it would lead to a loss of labour of labour income, lead to a loss of a job, um, lead to job losses, and that's 600,000 <coughs> across the EU, um, and and quite significantly as well, um, particularly perhaps from the trade union point of view, is a reduction in labour share of GDP. So a, a movement of um, of the share of GDP from labour to capital, um, which from an um, from a social equality point of view is um, is something to um, to really consider. So. Um, the, I th the, as Stephen said, there's been, as far as we know, there's been no specific um, evidence uh, research done on Scotland. The CBI yesterday gave evidence to the Biz Committee down in London, and they admitted that they haven't done any um, economic analysis cross of different sectors because obviously there's different impacts in different sectors in business in the UK. So that, that hasn't been done yet either. So. Um, so, you know, the job, we, we don't believe the jobs argument and the economic growth argument stacks up at all on TTIP and that the, um, if you take ISDS out, um, you've still got the, so you've got, so you've got questions over economic growth and jobs, um, the ISDS, which is, a, you know, which we disagree with, um, if, if the, even if that came out, you've still got the issue of regulatory harmonisation, so you've still got that what we think will be a downward pressure on the different standards that are there to protect um, public health, environment, you know, the food safety, um, which then has an impact on not on government's um, ability to make those sort of progress progressive policies, um, but but also the, in, uh, for example, the Scottish companies that you talked about in the agricultural sector and things potentially being at a disadvantage. Then, Stephen, did you want to come back? Been saying. I mean, the main study that's referenced, and certainly one the European Commission uses, is the Centre for Economic Policy Research. I think it's the one Liz was referring to as well. So they find that in 2027, and that would be 12 years after the implementation of TTIP in their model, uh, they believe that the US economy would have grown by 0.4%, more than otherwise would have been the case, and the, UK eco the European economy by 0.5% of EU GDP. It explicitly does not say it would lead to more jobs because it's a full employment model, it already assumes full employment. It thinks, although it's very tentative, that wages might be somewhat higher than they might otherwise have been, but very tentative finding. But it does find that it would be negative impacts for some workers. But I think the important things to extract from that model are that even if they are correct, assuming they're correct, that would imply an annual increment in GDP of about 0.03%. So the point being, you are never going to know. You know, the data is never going to be presented that's going to be able to prove that TTIP has had a positive impact on growth and jobs because the annual increment is so small, it's going to be lost in the rest of the data. And just to reiterate what I said in my opening remarks, the models explicitly also don't include those areas that could be detrimental to growth and jobs. Now, I mentioned uh, patents and I mentioned uh, the cost of 
drugs. And I think it's very important to remember that this is it's not a free trade agree agreement. It's about common regulatory structures. And you know, big pharmaceutical industries will be seeking to ensure that their patents last for you know they are stronger, longer, and far more reaching. You know, and I think we know enough about the dissemination of knowledge in economics to know that the impact of that on the wider economy is going to be negative over a longer period of time. And the models just don't consider issues like that. Okay, th thanks very much, Alec. Did you want to come back here? Yeah. On on that point, it is important that that we we do pursue that further because there is this assumption being made that there's a lot of good to come out of this. It's not just David Martin. MEP who says a good TTIP, the UK government, indeed the Scottish government, are saying that, that there, is, there is a lot of benefits to come for TTIP. They're, they're all saying we've got some concerns. So we need to perhaps, um, and, and, and perhaps those that are given evidence, we need to look further at what these so-called benefits of TTIP are. Um, in, terms of, in terms of, if I can just pick up on this question again about health services, because one of the issues we tried to tease out last week, um, and we don't pick it up, is this role of Scotland, given that, that as far as the European Union is concerned, it is the UK that is the state, um, and given that, that we have a lot of services that are privatised, health services that are privatised south of the border that are not privatised in Scotland, I mean, again, it's like, what would be the position as far as that is concerned. The, the position would be exactly how, how, I, how I depicted it. The EU <coughs> cannot, either through internal action or external action, even less so, I would argue, uh, compel the UK to change the status quo. So Scotland has decided to organise the provision of, of health services in a certain way because that is a, is a matter that is devolved to this parliament. So you as an administration, decide, you as a parliament and the Scottish government have decided to take certain steps so that provision of healthcare services remains in public hands. And the EU cannot change that. Remember that it's clear in the Aki that um, the distribution of competence, this application of the principle of conferred competence cannot be amended, uh, if not through treaty amendments. So again, extension of EU competencies in the field of public health cannot take place unless there is an amendment to the treaty. That also means that within their own competence, which is within the member states in that area. The member states decides how to best organise it. So you would take, as I said before, the action at Westminster level to take away the, reserve, the, the devolved area of competence in public health from yourselves and take it back to London if they really were feeling so strong and so inclined as to have the extension of principles such as those contained in the Health and Social Care Act 2012 also to Scotland. But as I said to you before, unless, unless what is happening now with the Smith Commission is something that I'm imagining, I don't see the, the process of devolution backtracking in that way. Quite to the contrary, it seems to me that there is a general consensus that the, Scot that the Scottish Parliament should get more powers. So I don't see Westminster, quite frankly, taking health care away from Holyrood and precluding Holyrood from taking certain, making certain choices and in particular maintaining health care provision into public hand. And, and, and like I said, TTIP cannot change that because the distribution of competence is a matter of constitutional law within the EU, such as the treaty is the constitution of the EU. And so unless you amend the treaty, that change simply cannot occur. I'd just like to do some, uh, some antiquity studies. In 2001, um, the European Court of Justice was asked to consider the question as to whether, at the time, the European community could accede to the European Convention on Human Rights, because there was an argument saying, oh, you know, human rights are you know, a keystone of uh, the rule of law and the protection of individuals within the EU. So there was almost an assumption that because the EU had accepted those principles, there was an unsaid and an unexpressed competence in the treaty. And the court said, no, I am sorry. Human rights policy is not within the policies that are being conferred to the EU, uh, to the European community at the time. Hence, the European community cannot, at the stage in which we are in the makeup of the treaties, accede to the convention. I suppose that the principle also apply, always applies and applies also in this case, unless there is a change in the constitutional makeup of the treaty to, give, conf to confer a competence to the EU, the EU cannot mandate on the member states how they should regulate the provision of health care. Okay. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. Vidi. Just to come back on your point about uh, Unite's um, opposition to TTIP, 
um, we were very clear about what the benefits of that should be, and it should be that the agreement would have a positive impact on jobs and income in the UK and Ireland, and not just for the benefit of business. We wanted the ISDS removed from the, the agreement and public services to be removed from the remit of the agreement and guarantees inserted to protect public provision and the possibility to renationalise. And also, as I mentioned before, we wanted binding and enforceable environmental and labour standards to be a central part of the agreement. So, um, for us, um, for all the reasons that I outlined previously, um, you know, uh, about our concerns ar around labour rights, um, the negative consequences from the agreement in terms of European workers, and the lack of transparency and the problems around the ISDS, that was what the rationale was for um, behind our executive decision to oppose TTIP. Stephen. Very quickly, come back to Alex's comments about uh, the Scottish Government, the UK Government, the EU Commission, all been very strongly in favour of this, you know, implying that there has to be lying underneath a very positive case for TTIP. I mean, I think this just kind of refers to, you know, the very deeply embedded economic orthodoxy around about free trade being a good thing. You know, now, you know, it's often said that comparative advantage is the only proposition in economics that is both at once true and non-trivial. You know, now that is true and that has led over the decades to people becoming very sympathetic towards free trade and politicians living in fear of ever being described as protectionist. You know, but I mean, I would argue that that leads to a situation where politicians don't interrogate the underlying case for agreements like this nearly as closely as they should do. I mean, it should be done with a real rigour, which is sadly lacking. So if that is indeed the case, then please, again, let someone present that case to us. Let them present it to us with some detail about how it refers to the Scottish economy as it is in real time, rather than some kind of state described in an economic model that doesn't refer to you know, the economy on the ground. And we have to also be aware, I think, of where some of the key economic impacts are seen as being. For instance, motor vehicles have spoken throughout the literature has been one of the areas that you know, trade will increase and there will be benefits to both sides. Well, that can only happen if the EU, frankly, is going to undermine its own regulatory framework, which has essentially traded off large cars for you know, lower emissions. You know, now, is that something that we want to see, even if it leads to more uh, jobs and growth? I would argue that might not happen anyway, but even if it did, that would not. Yeah, that is something that essentially the democratic governments of the EU have decided they don't want to happen, and that should not be circumvented through a free trade agreement. David. Just to give the UCU position in terms of, of a good TTIP, um, it, it may well be that a, a, the, there is a possibility for a good TTIP, but this certainly isn't it. The secret negotiating positions. The, the secrecy and the, the lack of, of public engagement and involvement in the whole process has set alarm bells ringing. It's, it's not something that people have been able to engage with. The lack of clarity over a number of questions that um, we've, we've raised this morning, without um, a, a rewrite and a restart of the process, our position is that, that we are opposed to, to the, the current process um, and you know, willing to engage in, in what's presented henceforth but as things stand just now, we're, we're in, in, in opposition. Thanks, David. Jimmy. Um, I'd like to ask a question to the NFU. Um, I'd have to declare that I'm a fully paid-up member um, before we start. Um, and so I obviously take a certain amount of notice of what they say. Um, you're talking here about, in your written submission, about uh, worries about beef imports particularly. Um, and the, uh, and the use of antimicrobial washes, anti sorry, washes for the purpose of reducing pathogens. Now, I asked about this when I was in Brussels recently, and um, one good example of this is chlorine disinfected chicken, which they use the whole time in the US. Um, and it's a practice, it's common practice in the UK to use this, but... Um, TTIP would reduce the, the tariff on the chicken. However, it could not remove the ban of the practice in question because it is banned over here. So, so, so you know, there wouldn't be a worry about that being sold over here. And the, the, the use and consumption of, uh, of GM foods, for example, uh, is regulated by the European, European Food Standards Agency. 
um, which again w w would not be uh, 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 that can't be tampered with. So I think the other my question to you, as as you know, somebody who's got an interest in livestock and, and uh, lot, representing a lot of farmers, um, you know, Scotch beef and Scotch lamb and Scotch salmon and Scotch whisky are all very important exports. And surely, to goodness, could, would it not be beneficial that we could export these now to, you know, I mean, there's been a ban on Scotch beef exports, I think, since foot and mouth, hasn't there? And that, that could well be lifted. Would that not be a benefit? Could we not export more lamb to the US? Could these not go to niche markets? I mean, looking at the positive side, um, and, and, you know, we would see some more growth in the industry. Uh, I just really would like your, your opinion on that. Uh, I mean, is it all negatives, or, or, or c can you see some positives there? Yes, it's certainly for agriculture, it's, it's not all negatives, but if we just deal with the food standards issue, issue first... Um, the US, over many years, has, has challenged the European Union in the World Trade Organization with regards to standards we've got in place for GMs, uh, saying they're unscientific, whether it be the, for the standards for the use growth promoters in their meat products, again, saying the ban in the EU is unscientific, and also about the chicken washing. Uh, they say that the ban in the EU is un unscientific. So from our point of view, the US has constantly challenged challenge these bans and continues to challenge, challenge these, these bans. Now, our concern is that once the TTIP agreement is reached, depending on what's in the final, um, the final document, you'll still actually probably see erosion over the course, course of time. Because one of the big gains for the, the US food producers is to get these products into the European Union. That's where they're going to get, get big gains from. So whether we see those sort of gains happen in day one, that might be open to dispute. We'll have to see a final agreement. But I think it's only a matter of time once this agreement gets put, put, in, put in place. What we need to have somewhere um, in the final agreement is this recognition that both the European Union and the United States, for both for legitimate reasons, take a different approach to food, food safety. Now, the, the US in particular want to have equivalent measures in place, so allowing the different uh, nations to take different approaches, but for them to be seen as having the same impact on food safety, therefore allowing free trade of, of goods back, backwards and forwards. Now, in theory, that would be fine, but generally speaking, most of the US measures uh, impose lower cost on their industry than the EU measures. So again, if that were to happen, we'd be put at a competitive dis disadvantage. If you look at the likes of, say, beef and lamb, where potentially we've got excellent products here in, in Scotland, we've got products that we believe would be in high demand uh, for affluent consumers in the United States of America. The rules that they've put in place following the BSE restrictions in the United Kingdom would prohibit us actually exporting to the US market. So again, unless we see some change there, there's potential to export, but the reality won't actually be realised in, in the next, next few, few years. So that also comes back to this idea of geographical indicators, where there's a different approach to the United States of America compared to Europe. So Europe tends to have a look at where the product's been produced, what actually goes into the tradition, the history of the production of that product, and therefore protects that product. Scotch whisky being you know, one of the classics here, Scotch beef being the, the other classic, or sal salmon as well. Now, for the United States of America, they tend to operate a different approach. They tend to look at the brand as being the important thing, rather, from, rather than where the product comes from and how that product is, is produced. Now, again, I would imagine there'll be many US firms who will be looking at the high-value Scottish products and seeing how they could copycat those products in, in some, some ways. So I'm not saying the whole TTIP deal is necessarily bad for agriculture. We do think long term there could be potential to, to export some products to, to the United States of America. But unless we actually have some sort of agreement in place that recognises the different approaches to food standards, which is legitimate, and unless we have some sort of uh, proper agreement in place that actually protects our products, 
then we do have concerns that the overall impact would be negative. And particularly if you go to some of the areas in Scotland, whether it be Orkney, Dumfries and Galway, the North East, where agriculture is such a large part of the economy, if agriculture were to be decimated or harmed by this, this agreement, we'd actually see it feeding through to not just farm farms, not just to the businesses that, that rely directly upon farms, hauliers, vets and the like, but through the whole of these regional regional economies. But you don't think, sorry, can I just, uh, the, I mean, the, the potential of the, of the markets is obviously enormous if you can get them in there. Uh, uh, so you are, you, your concern really is about the fact that we would have to drop our standards. Is that what your concern is? I, I, I'm not necessarily going to say we would have to drop our standards. What I'm, what I'm saying is we've got different standards to well, to we've those, got higher those standards. I, I in, think, in think we've got some higher standards, really. And, well, our, our, I would say we have higher standards. Other people may dispute that, but our standards impose extra costs on our businesses that the standards in the United States don't um, don't mm. impose. Now, I think our standards are correct. They're what the consumers in the United Kingdom and in the European Union have voted for. But as I sort of alluded to before, there's often a difference to what people vote for and believe should be put in place compared to the purchasing decisions they actually make when they go to, to the supermarkets. So the concern is that if we keep our high standards, which I think we should do, but we allow products in that operate to different standards, then we'll actually reduce uh, the amount of product that we produce here. In, but you in wouldn't Scotland. be able to, I mean, the chlorine in fact uh, washed chicken, you wouldn't be able to sell that. In, in the UK or, 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 or anywhere in Europe. Yeah, you certainly wouldn't be able to sell it immediately in, in the United Kingdom. But I think with the United States, who've constantly argued this point at the World Trade Organization, I would be surprised if they don't continue to argue it under the final TTIP agreement. And if we don't see these products coming in from day one, then I would suspect at some point in time, we as an organization would be back at this parliament saying, hang on, we're finding that these products are coming into the, into the EU, or there's a deal way to be put in place that will allow these products to, to come into the EU. So our, our fear isn't, say, what will happen on day one, but about the long-term impacts of what this TTIP agreement could, could put in place. So it's about putting in protections at this, this stage. So un, unlike some, we're not saying we shouldn't sign up to the TTIP agreement, but there should be protections that are put in place that actually recognises the differences uh, in, in policy that takes place here in the European Union. Thank you. Richard, uh, Dixon, I wonder if, if, if yes. you can expand a wee bit and then go into some of the, maybe the evidence that, that you produced to, as written evidence. That would be helpful. Thanks. So um, on the issue of good TTIP, so of course sometimes it is good to harmonise certain things. So across Europe we've done some good work on that. That's why we have some of our best environmental laws, some of our worker protection, it's because we've agreed that across Europe. To take a trivial example, if we had standardised USB cables, so there were only two sorts, hundreds of millions of people would not have to buy a new cable every time Apple produced a new product. And that would actually save materials, energy and people's money. So standardisation can be a really good thing. But just to sum up some of the things you've heard around the table and in the written evidence, is TTIP possibly something good if we, if we change it so that it could be? Well, you've already heard that there's very light regulation between the EU and the US, so that the differences aren't that great. You've heard that the reality is probably, particularly if TTIP becomes a bit more restricted, that the economic benefits of TTIP are absolutely tiny across the economy. You've heard that there are threats to key sectors like agriculture and to key interests like chemicals legislation. You've heard that ISDS is a potential night nightmare in terms of locking people up in legal actions and in terms of stopping countries and the EU itself from carrying on being progressive and protecting workers more, protecting the environment more, protecting people's health more. And, of course, at the same time, you've got the public excited about this, you've got politicians spending lots of time talking about this, so you would have to conclude, having heard all that, it's absolutely not worth it. We should just stop now because it's a complete waste of time, particularly politicians' time. Um, so, just to come back to the chemicals issue, I think that's an interesting example. And uh, Jamie was talking about, for instance, the chlorinated, chlorine-cleaned chickens and saying, well, we can't bring these in because they're banned. 
I think that fundamentally TTIP is going to work if there's deregulation. So 80% of the gains from TTIP are supposed to be about changing regulations. So some of these things we think are good protections in Europe are going to have to go if US company is going to make money here. And maybe there's a, a vice versa as well, but that's a bit we're worried about. So if the impact of TTIP was that the chemicals regulation in the United States became as good as the European chemicals regulation, then that would be great. That would be a good bit of TTIP, and that would be a great gain for the world. It would be a greater protection for people in the States, even though the European regime isn't perfect. It's still much better than the US one. But that seems very unlikely to happen. You've got all these corporations in the States already, as, as has been mentioned at WTO in, in other fora, arguing that, oh, well, these chemical protections in the, in the EU are unjustified. The precautionary principle isn't scientific, so you can't ban these things. That's the pressure we're facing. So again, as Scott suggests, we might go into this thinking, oh, we've safeguarded this stuff, but in five years' time, we'll argue about it again, and in 10 years' time, some more. And uh, the example I've given in here is about hormone-disrupting chemicals, which I've been campaigning on for 15 years or so. We've made some good progress. Some things have been banned, both here and in the United States. F the example I give is France has gone further. So these chemicals, which affect the baby in the womb, which affect development of the child, which can cause cancers. They've been banned in baby bottles. In, the, in France, they are now going to ban them in any kind of food product that contains baby food and in cooking utensils. And that's a step which is certainly a grey area and possibly actually illegal in European law. So France, to protect their citizens, particularly babies, are going beyond probably what they're really allowed to do by Europe. So that's an ideal thing for TTIP to create a challenge on, because here is, a, here is a protectionist measure which is stopping the US producing terrible things to feed babies on, or nasty plastic spatulas with phthalates in. So uh, that's the kind of territory we'll get into. And I think, so to come back to my point, the fundamental of this is that TTIP isn't worth doing unless there's lots of deregulation. And if there's lots of deregulation, then all the things we're worried about are going to happen, and so TTIP isn't worth doing. So either way, it's not worth doing. Okay, pretty conclusive, Liz. Degree. <laughs> <laughs> I'd agree um, completely with Richard, and and also pick up on Stephen's point to um, to urge you to to um, I guess be courageous and and um, and look at and don't just accept accept the kind of mantra of international competitiveness and and the need for economic growth. Um, and, um, and, you know, to, to be rigorous in your intellectual kind of um, looking at, uh, in the way that you look at that, I, that um, whole idea and, and the, the underlying driver that it is for so many decisions and particularly around TTIP. So, um, is it, should I mention anything about transparency? There's a yeah, well, I, I was going to go to that, but I don't know, Willie was wanting to come in as well, but yeah, what, just, just do something about transparency. Um, only to say that you could, that there, are, you know, there are specific things that, could, that you could also call for in terms of transparency. So there, some stuff yesterday has, has been, has, uh, there's commitments now to making things public, but for example, it's negotiating texts that have already been shared with governments, so you, what you won't be able to see even from those is um, what's still under discussion. So you can look at other, tr other treaty discussion, um, yeah, other processes under other, even even the WTO, which is highly criticised, um, puts out um, negotiating text with words in brackets, I believe, of the areas that are still under negotiation. So you could push further for that. Um, um, and for MEPs to be able to see some of the consolidated um, texts and the negotiating positions as well. There's going to be, a, um, from December onwards, um, commissioners and senior staff will have to publish all their contacts and meetings held with stakeholders, but that would be good to see retrospectively as well, so we can see what meetings, and obviously that would include all, all, any meetings with any of us, as well as um, of industry. Um, and there's a proposal for a mandatory register of lobbyists. Um, are there, but we would say that that absolutely, that proposal should be carried through, and that, that's really important. So there's some progress being made, and that's and that's good to see the European Commission responding to public concern. That's what, where that's come from. Um, but we think there's more, and I could pass you those specific suggestions if that's helpful. Yeah, that is very helpful. Is there anybody got anything else to say on transparency? I think points have been well made. Well, did you want to come in with your final point? Yeah, 
did. Thanks very much, Convener. I just wanted to come back to the ISDS again. Um, Liz, you, you were telling us about some of the examples uh, from around the world of these disputes. Um, I wanted to ask you if, if any of them or all of them had been successful and national governments here, there or everywhere had ultimately had to pay out hundreds of millions of pounds, euros or dollars in these, these cases. And really, again, what is it that is going to protect us further? I know Dave's Dave's paper suggested that we should remove the, the ISDS mechanism, but does that give us the protection that, that we think we need, or are we, are we just creating a lawyer's paradise here for ourselves with, with TTIP? Um, so on the on your the first half of your question about um, the outcomes of different um, investor state disputes. Um, I can give you a few little facts and figures. I could also give you this information afterwards to save a bit of time now. But um, there's at the end of 2012, there were 514 disputes were known of, um, and in that year, actually, there was more than more um, disputes filed than in that one year than ever before. But um, so of the known concluded state um, investor state cases, 42 were decided in favour of the state. So the, so the, the, corp the corporations, they, they don't always win on these cases at all. 31% went in favour of the investor, though, so in favour of the business um, or corporation taking out the case. Um, but there's an additional... And, and so in some cases, obviously, the state had to pay compensation to the investor, and in other cases, it didn't, where it lost. Um, but there's legal, there's legal costs involved there as well and and it's different to national i believe different to national um legal systems where you don't necessarily get the costs if you're the the, the winner doesn't the loser winner whichever way around it is in national courts about who who gets who gets the costs that doesn't always apply in um in these international arbitration cases but um quite a number 27 percent of them were settled um without um a verdict from those arbitration, and that's also where you can, where there maybe is um, maybe payments or con or concessions for an investor. So that's also where um, you you could see that um, that squeezing of kind of policy space for a go a, where there's been negotiations go gone on outside that arbitration um, hearing, uh, and where perhaps a government has agreed to relax some re legislation on something just to to stop that case from going through any further so it, it's varied it's variable <laughs> um and what was the second part of your question yeah, it was just how, how can we protect ourselves if the mechanism is removed are we protected yeah. or do we still have our lawyers they've taken it out yeah. of the australia us free trade agreement um at the i think at the that was push the australians were, pu were pushing for that so that free trade agreement has gone ahead without one without one in it so there absolutely are precedents for them not to not to be in there and we can see that the um there's actually there's a, pa a paper by the lse um which biz commissioned about the costs and benefits of the of the um of the investment protection part of the treaty and they said that the eu investment chapter is likely to provide the uk with few or no benefits and actually comes with some um economic and political costs so again i can i can give you the link to look at that really helpful thank you dave did you want to make a thing i mean probably declaring interest a lawyer's paradise sounds like a very good thing um uh, but sadly trade union lawyers don't tend to get paid that much so it's uh, it's less of a paradise for me uh, <laughs> No, I'm going to keep going at it. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, obviously, withdrawing ISDS from it is, is, is our solution, and we offer that to you as, as, as the way forward. But uh, rather than, um, I agree entirely with what, what this is about, the cases, I, I would be less concerned um, uh, about the actual cases and the, and the costs than the regulatory chill point that Richard and I have both made to you. Can I give you just one example of that? A lot of the organisations around this table very recently came together as a big coalition to try and persuade you in the procurement bill, well now the Procurement Act, to take a whole range of actions, um, you know, from uh, from international development to environmental factors, to living wage, and so on and so forth, uh, and and tax dodging obviously was one of those that many of us argued as well. And I think we persuaded you in some cases, not in all, but we persuaded you in quite a lot of cases that this was a, a good thing, and the Scottish Procurement Act has at least these matters down down in principle. That I think is a that if you remember that if 
you were involved in that piece of legislation, you remember long briefings from us and from the law officers and everybody else about, oh, well, we can't do this because the law officers say this might be challenged and that might be challenged and there's a risk here. Can you just imagine, you know, if the Scottish Government took a tough line on, on aggressive tax avoidance, uh, what position of US corporations would be under TTIP uh, on, on this point? You know, their lawyers would be flying over in their, in their droves uh, to challenge uh, challenges on, on, on that on that point uh, and that I think is the real risk here it's just that you know, government essentially is frozen with concern about what might happen in terms of legal challenge okay I'm going to finish there because we're just sort of running over time Rod did you want in yeah. you want the, the last points have been dealt with on transparency so yeah. I think I've exhausted, I've exhausted everything um, you uh, are, are a first session obviously on on TTIP, we're meeting with the business industry in a few weeks' time, and we have put requests into the UK government, the Scottish government, and the Commission. So we intend to take a very, very broad sweep on this. Um, but I think for informing us and in some of the, the themes that we would take forward, it's been very, very helpful. Please always realise that the committee members and the clerk's office is always open to any more information that you can help us to help us inform. We take on board that we should be very, very um, intellectual about how we um, we decide the, the evidence. And, and, I, and as I said at the open, the, the written evidence was very, very helpful in allowing me to formulate some of the questions that I wanted, um, and certainly the committee as well. So uh, thank you uh, for your time this morning. Thank you for your evidence. And hopefully um, this will not be the last we will see each other to discuss um, TTIP. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to briefly suspend for five minutes to allow for a quick comfort break.
Uh, welcome back to the uh, European and External Relations Committee. Moving on to our next agenda, which is agenda item three. We are looking at our Brussels bulletin this morning. Um, comments, questions, clarifications? Just, it just raises this question of transparency, which is on page one. It was raised by a, a, a speaker from World Development Movement. It would be quite interesting to know whether there was any form of debate about whether transparency should be retrospective in any way, or as it's coming in on the 1st of December next week. Yeah, we can find that out. We had some information yeah. yesterday. Alan Smith sent round a, I saw, saw a, a that, yeah. newsletter, which I yeah. sent on to Katie, um, because it gave us a sort of a bang up to date situation. But yeah, definitely, because I think it's, this is an evolving one of transparency, where you know it seems to be getting more information added to it every day. Anything else? Willie, sorry, what, Willie? Yeah, sorry. Thanks, convener. It's just to, to draw members' attention to the original policy, page page nine there, that gives us the information that 11.8 billion euros uh, aimed at, well, cohesion policy funding that includes youth employment. Our, our members around the committee have been quite interested in how that will develop and pan out in the future. And it's just to ask that we can keep a close eye on that and how it develops, particularly for parts of the west of Scotland that we know are included in this um, initiative. Yeah, well, um, in our next inquiry that we've got coming up, we've agreed to do work on that anyway, so it'll be there, but we can um, get an update. Yeah. Rod? Yeah, no, just on, uh, uh, I don't, in, in terms of the post-G20, um, the call to states to declare intentions in relation t to uh, combat climate change as preparation for the 2015 Paris Climate Summit. Uh, I don't know whether there is a timetable set for uh, states to actually provide that clarity on national intentions. Again, I'd be quite interested to know. Okay. Yeah, we can check that out. Alec. Convener, it's interesting under the transatlantic trade, and we've just had the session, but the, the last bit of the sentence here, the European Commission has launched an online survey for SMEs to better understand the difficulties they face in doing business with the United States. And I just wonder that in terms of where we're at, where our TTIP, it might be useful for us to actually get a better understanding of Scottish companies' involvement with, with the US um, in, terms of, in terms of markets and exports. And that might be something that we can we follow up. Yeah, well, Katie's away ahead of you on that one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been looking at um, actually some American business speakers and things as well that have been doing some work on this. Um, but I think uh, round table, the next round table, will have uh, a few. You'll notice a few um, uh, uh, recognisable Scottish businesses. I think have we got the Scottish Salmon Company. Have we got no. Still, we're still, we're still waiting for Marine Harvest. There's a few. There's a few people that we have. Have, have contacted and are still awaiting the responses. And of responses. course, all the whiskey so, companies. Yep, they're on that list too, Jamie. They're on so that will list. So, yeah. will it be um, an easy enough thing to give us in terms of just a brief note on what kind of trade we're doing with America? Yeah, yeah we'll, get, we'll get that. We'll have that ready for the next meeting anyway. You'll have Brilliant. something. Um, I just thought that sentence jumped out at me as well, Alec, because it, it almost suggested a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in that, that sense, you know, that they were already talking about how here's. How you can work better, but yeah. okay, Claire. I agree. We should be at better understanding. The big companies are great, and whiskey and salmon, marine harvest are huge. But um, I recently read an article about a small brewery who had managed to, to to sort of get into the American market in the microbrewery side. So it would be good to look at the small to medium enterprise areas in this as well, if possible. We're ahead of you, Anna and Gun. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Should know better. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, because uh, there might be a time when we'll not be way ahead of you and we, we need to know. <laughs> Any more comments, Jimmy? It's made me noticing that, that Cecilia Malmström, who's the EU Trade Commissioner, did sort of say a few things about TTIP. Um, I mean, that she was obviously quite pro it. Um, there's a, a paragraph on that. I don't know if you saw it on page five. On page five. And um, there was, uh, it's, I just wanted to think about plastic bags, um, which the, it says the EU is, wants to phase them out completely. I'm just, 
Um, I mean, we put a charge on them. This doesn't, I mean, I don't think that a 5p charge is ever going to phase out plastic bags. Um, in fact, in wet climate, you know, uh, I just rather it was the sort of people walking around with a lot of paper bags with the bottoms falling out and they're doing their shopping. Lawn down the street, is that the picture you've got? Yeah. Well, I mean, in Italy and places, they have paper bags, but they, they, it's a very hot country, you know. I mean, if you put a paper bag down on the, on the ground and it gets wet and the shopping falls out of the bottom. <laughs> Has there not been some initial figures in the, the first month of the, the charge on plastic bags and it had been reduced by, like... 420 million yeah, because people are bringing their bigger yeah. people are bringing their bigger plastic bags yeah. to put the stuff into. Yeah, mine's are all Hessian, Jamie. Mine's or maybe they're made of Hessian or something. I don't know. <laughs> Carpet bags. It would be quite interesting to know where we are, kind of from that very first few weeks figure. In, in I wonder if the to food that, that target of 90 per person. Mm -hmm. yeah. If the food stand says yeah. it will allow you to go on putting the same food again and again into plastic bags without having to wash them. Because presumably sooner or later someone will get food poisoning. If doing that. <laughs> I bet you they will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good, okay. it's good stuff, Come here, thanks. Can I just come back to the TTIP uh, issue again? The, and our colleague uh, Stephen Boyd, I think it was from STC, he, he kind of basically t told us that no matter what we do, we've really got to ask that any data that's presented in, in the way of argument supporting the initiative has to stand up to scrutiny. And there was quite, two quite contrasting examples from Liz Murray about how good TTIP was in one hand, but how bad it was in another. So I know it's not our role to do this analysis and scrutiny of the, the value of TTIP to the European Union, but whoever comes to see us, I think, should be able to cite data in support of their respective arguments so that we could maybe even have a look at that because I think it's quite fundamental that you're able to scrutinise the data that people are presenting there in, in, in support of their argument here. Well, we have invited the, the UK trade um, investment person, so... I don't to add to Spice's workload, but there's probably kind of a, a moving feast with kind of further work in preparation for further meetings on TTIP so that we can really ask pertinent questions. Yep. I don't know whether it's already been mentioned, but I noticed that on the 10th of November, the, uh, the Agriculture and Fisheries Council, the UK, was represented by um, uh, Rupert Morley and Richard Lockhead. So that's an adv advance, isn't it? For, because in that, that what... It, Beyond words, he's actually, what he's, you know, because that's what you've been asking for, the SNP, isn't it? It's Jamie. What? Depends who calls the shots. Well, he was representing anyway. It does say that. He wasn't allowed to speak, Jimmy. He wasn't allowed to speak on the 10th of November. Are you sure? I'm well, he can't have represented if he, did, if, he, if, he, if he wasn't allowed to say anything. Indeed. Okay. Okay, happy to bring the Brussels Bulls into attention of our other colleagues and committees. Okay, excellent. Agenda item four is the draft budget scrutiny, which we agreed to take in private. So I'll briefly suspend to allow us to get into private.